Up next on Think, author Isabel Wilkerson on why America's racial hierarchy amounts to a caste system with white people at the top, black people at the bottom, and everybody else somewhere in between. So you can think of caste as the bones, race as the skin. What was used in determining caste was what you look like. Race became the tool, the signifier, the cue of where you fit in the hierarchy. Wilkerson's new book argues the world's three most prominent caste systems occurred in India, the United States, and Nazi Germany. Our conversation starts after a short break. Funding for Think comes from TCU, where faculty do research for the greater good, like Professor Dean Williams, who uses genetic mapping to help save the horned lizard from extinction. TCU, lead on. Isabel Wilkerson's first book, The Warmth of Other Suns, was a New York Times bestseller and a recipient of the National Book Critics Circle Award. It told the stories of the Great Migration, in which some six million black Americans left their homes in former slave states in the mid-20th century for destinations they hoped would offer greater safety and opportunity. Most demographers say the Great Migration ended by about 1970. Fifty years past that time, Wilkerson's new book explores the seemingly immutable hierarchy that still prescribes the place people get to occupy socially and economically in the United States. Wilkerson has come to believe this country has a caste system, an artificial but inescapable hierarchy that privileges whiteness over almost every other possible category so that morality, work ethic, creativity or talent or the lack of those things fail to change anybody's rank. White skin will probably keep you at the top. Black skin is likely to keep you at the bottom. From KERA in Dallas, this is Think. I'm Chris Boyd. Wilkerson's new book is called Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents, and just this week it was named a finalist for a National Book Award. I spoke with Wilkerson late last week via video chat about how she developed her ideas about caste in America and what makes it a more useful description than race or class or economic status. Isabel, welcome back to Think. Oh, thank you for having me. Can you start by talking a little more about what you mean by a caste system? Well, a caste system essentially is an artificial, arbitrary ranking of human value uh, in a society, and it determines one's standing, one's uh, rank, one's level of respect that's accorded them or withheld from them, benefit of the doubt, resources or lack thereof, even assumptions of uh, intelligence and beauty, uh, resourcefulness, uh, reliability, Um, beauty even, I mean, every aspect of human value that can be accorded an individual um, is given a rank, and within that ranking um, are the assumptions and values that are accorded to that. The other thing about a caste system is essentially it's an infrastructure. It's it's an embedded uh, infrastructure that is in place underneath so much of what we might think we see. In, and there can be any number of metrics that could be used in determining one's rank in any hierarchy. And in the hierarchy that has developed in the United States from the time of the colonial uh, Virginia, uh, the ranking was based upon what people look like. In other words, what we now come, come to call race. So the colonial Virginia example is interesting because it started on the basis of religion. How did it morph so quickly into the basis of color? The needs of the colonists, as we know, was to were to essentially survive, first of all, and then to build a country. Uh, and in order to do that, we know that they had to, they ultimately exiled and decimated the numbers of, uh, of indigenous people who at first they had sought to enslave and were not able to do that. And so uh, they then turned to find the cheapest labor that they could, which meant uh, importing people, human beings, Africans, to to this new colony to work and to build this colony, to build a new country. And in doing so, they positioned themselves at the top of this of the hierarchy that they were building. And the very first thing that they used to distinguish who was heathen and who was a cultured person who could be part of the, the dominant group was religion. And they viewed people who were not Christian as, as being heathen and thus not part of the dominant group. The problem with that for them was that 
people began to recognize that that was a way to be accorded rights and privileges. And so they began to convert to Christianity. And so then there needed to be a new category to clearly delineate who could do what in this new country. And over the course of the first and middle decades of the 17th century, the colonists created laws that defined and assigned roles to people based upon ultimately what they look like. And in doing so, they created a new, a fairly new category for human beings, which would be race. Race was not a defining feature for people before there was this combination of people converging into this one place, people who looked different from one another. If you were in Europe and you were Irish or you were Polish, you were not defining yourself primarily by the color of your skin. You were surrounded by people who looked like you, so that was not a salient feature that had any meaning. People in Sub-Saharan Africa were not needing to define themselves by the color of their skin because they were surrounded by people who were so similar. Only when these groups came together, and of course some by choice and some by force, did the salient features that would be neutral in other aspects come to be the defining uh, identity for, for human beings. And, and, and we've adjusted to it for so long that we take this as the laws of nature, but this was a creation, it's a social construct. Well, one feature that's common to a lot of caste systems is the use of either the justification that these are the laws of nature or these are the laws of God. Religion was still used in service to the system by claiming that this must be what God wanted of humankind. Yes, that was, as you know from the book, I, I identified eight pillars of caste. So there are eight characteristics that they all have in common. And the first one that I cite is foundational because it's the, it's the belief system that allows a dominant group or a society in general to justify these inequities, to justify the differences in the ways people may be treated and justify enslavement in the case of the United States. And the idea in the United States was that being Christian, primarily the, the colonists were Christian, they justified their decisions by saying that Noah's son, Ham, had disrespected his father by happening to walk in uh, whilst Noah happened not to be clothed. And thus he was cursed and his descendants were cursed to serve the other members of the family as his brothers. And so th that was interpreted by European colonists as justification by saying that people from Africa were the descendants of Ham and thus were consigned to and had been cursed with the role, the God-given role of being servants or slaves to, to others. So that, was, that was their place and that was what they used to justify enslavement. So the three most notable caste systems you found in your research were India, that most, most people are familiar with, the United States that we're talking about today, and Nazi Germany. The Nazis were so impressed by the organization of the Jim Crow South that they specifically studied Plessy versus Ferguson. Yes, I mean, this was just stunning to, uh, to discover in the process of the research for a book that was about caste and primarily about our understanding of our own country and then looking to other places to better understand hierarchy. And um, I should say that I, you know, I came to this discovery uh, about Germany. Um, I, in fact, started looking at Germany in the first place only because of Charlottesville. Um, in Charlottesville, that's where we saw uh, the symbols of both the Confederacy and of Nazi Germany converging in the uh, regalia of the uh, of the people who were protesting the possible removal of the statue of Robert E. Lee. And so they themselves made this connection across time, across oceans, uh, across cultures, that they saw a connection between their cause and that of what had happened in, in Germany. Uh, and so I, that's what took me uh, to Germany uh, in the first place, to try to understand how they were managing memory, how they were managing their history, and to, with an eye toward understanding our own better. Um, but what I discovered was that there were all of these other connections that I never would have imagined. Um, for one thing, it turned out, turned out that German eugenicists were uh, in dialogue with American eugenicists in the years leading up to the Third Reich. It turned out that American eugenicists were writing books that were bestsellers in Germany. Um, the, uh, American ideals about eugenicism at that time. Eugenicism at that time. Now, of course, the Nazis needed no one, no one to teach them how to hate. They did not need to look to the United States to learn how to hate. That they did not need. 
But what they did was they, they actually sent researchers to the United States to study the Jim Crow laws, to study the laws that have been in place for actually uh, for, for, for uh, more than a century, uh, those laws that were in, in place to uh, control uh, and to subjugate African Americans. They studied the anti-miscegenation laws, meaning laws against marriage across racial lines. They studied other laws that, uh, that were used in, during the Jim Crow South to keep the groups separate. So they studied these things as they were trying to construct what would ultimately become the Nuremberg Laws. <laughs> You mentioned anti-miscegenation anti laws. That's another feature common to caste systems. Everyone sort of understands that if you have a whole lot of intermarriage, it's going to be harder to classify people. So caste systems try very hard to control who marries and, and uh, ultimately mates with who. Absolutely. In fact, that's one of the um, almost unrecognizable tragedies of of uh, that feature of a caste system, because what it ultimately does, it works to create the very thing that it's claiming is existing. In other words, by keeping the lines separate and not permitting people to marry or even to, to love across uh, racial lines, uh, to mate or, or procreate across uh, racial, across the artificial lines that have been created, then that is what actually creates the very thing, the very division. So the people over the generations begin to look a certain way. You could say that the population of America is the result of the curation of its population because people were only permitted to marry and to mate and to have children with only certain kinds of people. Of course, we know that during enslavement, um, many of the, um, the slave uh, masters were, uh, were uh, uh, raping and, and having children, impregnating uh, um, uh, enslaved women. So that was obviously a way that they found to to uh, to get around this. But essentially, the the goal of of the anti-miscegenation laws was to keep people apart. And the other thing that I think is so important about this that we are living with today in ways that we might not um, might not be so obvious is that by keeping people from being able to you know, to fall in love and to marry and to have uh, connections with people of different races in their family systems. It creates an even harder, stronger, um, more impermeable line. That means that, that individuals would not have a vested interest in or feel uh, the natural connection or a stake in the happiness, well-being uh, of other of people who do not look like them. In other words, it hardened the lines between different groups so that individuals over time and over generations would have no natural stake in the well-being of people who did not look like them. It, it, actually, uh, it actually affirms and creates the very division that it was uh, imagining to begin with. You share a story in the book that I had never heard before of Martin Luther King's trip to India in 1959. He went to speak to a high school. What happened there? So he, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King and his wife, they went to, uh, to India in 1959. Um, very much, uh, he was very much inspired by the work of, of Mohandas K. Gandhi, of course, nonviolent protest. And so when he arrived, he was actually uh, greeted as a, a visiting dignitary, which, which he was. Uh, but on the trip, he, he made a, a visit to uh, a, a school where the students and the faculty were, were Dalits, um, what would now be considered, um, now called Dalits, but formerly known as untouchables. And uh, so when he, when he arrived, the uh, principal introduced him to the uh, students and he said, students, I want you to meet a fellow untouchable from America. And when Dr. King heard those words, uh, they did not land easily on, on the the bit peeved, in fact, to be um, you know seen as as an untouchable. I mean, he was he had had dinner with the prime minister. He'd been treated as a visiting dignitary. People had asked him for his autograph. So he thought, clearly, I'm not uh, I'm untouchable. I'm not at the bottom. I actually, you know, I'm a, I'm a, a dignitary, uh, you know, uh, here here in the country. But then he thought about it. He thought about. Um, the fact that at that very moment there were 20 million um, African Americans who he was advocating on their behalf. Uh, he himself had um, been, uh, you know, had had faced the violence that had um, occurred 
uh, directed toward people who were uh, seeking um, uh, equality and recognition and basic human rights in their country. Those people that he was representing, African Americans, were at that very moment not being permitted to vote. Many of them, uh, the majority actually, were the, who were living in the South were not being permitted to vote and to have basic access to, to uh, resources and to public facilities. And so he thought about it and he said to himself, yes, I am an untouchable. I am an untouchable and every Negro in America is an untouchable. And so this is what he said as a way of, of recognizing he himself, Dr. Martin Luther King, recognized the connection between India and the United States, between their caste system and the hierarchies in America. I'm Chris Boyd, and today we're talking to Isabel Wilkerson, author of Cast, The Origins of Our Discontent, now among the nominees on the National Book Awards long list for nonfiction. Support for KERA comes from you, our members, and from the Texas Secretary of State, providing voters details on which approved forms of photo ID they can take to the polls. More at votetexas.gov or 800-252-VOTE. This is Think. I'm Chris Boyd. Today we're talking to Isabel Wilkerson, winner of the Pulitzer Prize and National Humanities Medal, about her book, Cast, The Origins of Our Discontent. Let's return to that conversation. So you visited India a couple of years ago and realized very quickly you had an almost uncanny ability to, to spot people who were in that so-called untouchable caste. What did you as a Black American woman see that looked familiar to you? Well, you know, for one thing, I should say that that uh, I, can, I can only determine that or only um, uh, uh, see that if there are a group of people. Because one of the things that um, Dr. Bimrao Bedker, who was a, a leader of, uh, of the Dalit movement in the mid 20th century, said that there was never caste singular, only castes, as a reminder that this is a function of people who are interacting, intersecting, and then positioning themselves vis-a-vis -vis others. And so it was there that I was able to see uh, the uh, how people were interacting and who was dominating in a conversation, who was more submissive in an interaction. Those were the behaviors of subject of being subjected versus dominant. And I could see that instantly. It was very, very obvious to me. Uh, I happened to be in, in conversation with a, with a Dalit scholar. Uh, we were having a wonderful conversation of just uh, sharing uh, experiences. And uh, in some ways, the experiences were so similar that we could finish each other's uh, sentences. It was uncanny. Uh, and, and then in the middle of the conversation, a woman came up and she interrupted us as we were talking. And I, not, I did not know very many people there, uh, so I didn't know what their connection was. And so the woman just came in and she started to um, instruct the, uh, the woman that I was speaking to, the Dalit uh, scholar, as to what she should have done in her presentation, how she should improve the next time, what she missed and what she might consider uh, when she speaks of this another time. And she stayed there for quite a bit and was sort of chastising the scholar uh, who I was having this conversation with. Of course, remember, she had interrupted a, a conversation on, on top of that. And so after the woman, this other woman left, I then, uh, I then uh, uh, said to the Dalit scholar that I was talking with, I said, did you, do you know her? Why, why would, did you know her? I just assumed maybe this is someone that you knew. And she said, oh, no, 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 I, I, I don't know her. No, she, she's upper caste and she wanted to, me to know that, that she was above me. <laughs> So I take your point that castes really only exist in relationship to one another. That said, you also explain that the dominant caste often finds a way to create a kind of mini hierarchy that exists within the subjugated caste. What is the reason for that? What does that do for the dominant caste? So, you know, we have to go back to, uh, you know, colonial Virginia where, um, you know, they were, uh, under increasing stre uh, pressures to survive, to provide profit, obviously, to the crown, and then also to establish themselves in, a, in an alien landscape. And so in doing so, uh, 
They were dealing with uh, the indigenous people who obviously were uh, were defending what was their land. They also had uh, were bringing in people who were uh, indentured servants uh, coming in from uh, from Europe, uh, who also were uh, expected to help build this country. And of course, there were the enslaved people who were brought in. And it turned out that in in 1676 there was a, a rebellion called Bacon's Rebellion, in which the uh, after experiencing you know decades of what was then an emerging colony uh, it turned out that the indig that the uh, indentured servants who were uh, who were uh, uh, a, a European descent and then also the enslaved people were uh, not being treated well at, at all obviously and the enslaved people were treated being treated worse but everyone was being treated poorly and so they actually you know rallied together um, and that posed a tremendous threat to those who I would say were the elites among the dominant caste. And that is what set in motion um, an even more um, determined effort to, to confine and define who could do what in that colony. And it was at that point that the caste system hardened and was uh, became essentially the standard for how the, the groups would, would be uh, expected to interact. It's what determined, uh, of course, who could marry whom. Uh, the, this was the era in which uh, people were, uh, the rights of, of being able to inherit were established uh, or reified. This is where it was defined and codified. And this is where the caste system actually gelled into to what would ultimately be the defining way of, of, of interaction for the next century and a half, the next two centuries, you might say. Uh, and so that was why this was that was seen as necessary to create gradations beneath those on top. It's, it's you know it's really so simple as in some ways it's divide and conquer, and that that's what they did. Another pillar of caste is heritability. This idea that no matter who you are or what you do, what you have achieved, um, the caste assigned to you at birth is fixed. So, in this country, you can be an Academy Award-winning actor who walks into a deli, decides it's too crowded and walks out quickly and you get stopped at the door. Yeah, that was Forrest Whitaker, um, you know, one of our most accomplished actors who just went into a deli in Manhattan. Um, and, you know, as anyone might just go in to see if you see something on the menu that you want and uh, didn't, and he walked, walked toward the door and he was stopped at the door and he was searched right there in front of all the other uh, customers who were also stunned by what was going on. Um, and, you know, he, he has described that as such a deeply humiliating moment. Um, for anyone, of course, but when you were reminded of how, um, you know, this is why I describe class as different from caste. So you can think of you can think of of caste as the bones, race as the skin, and then class is the diction and the accents, the clothing, uh, education, the things, the, the personal accomplishments that one might attain. Uh, as one goes about in this world, the things that you can control. And so this is an example of how he had reached this, you know, the highest level in his field, um, obviously um, very accomplished and successful. And yet he, in an instant, because he was, he was born to a group that is assigned historically to the lowest caste, the subordinated caste, and is recognizable because what was used in determining caste was what you look like. Race becomes became the tool, the signifier, the cue of where you fit in the hierarchy. And so that is inescapable in the hierarchy that's been created. So that at any moment, anyone, regardless of their accomplishments, their standing in other ways, could be disrupted in their day and are reminded of, of their caste, even to this day. I know you're aware of this. There are people who say, well, the existence of someone like a Forrest Whitaker means that um, that caste is not immutable in this country, that people can sort of rise to the level of their talents. How does a caste system accommodate the fact that some people will do very well economically, will become sort of well-loved across the general population, and yet cause those people to remain within the place prescribed for them by caste? Well, one of the things uh, about uh, a caste system is that there have always been uh, certain segments where African Americans, for example, were permitted to um, have some level of 
success. Um, and generally that had to do with during the time of enslavement, African Americans were seen as, uh, as entertainment. And uh, so that for particularly in entertainment, that, that was a realm that was seen as not as threatening. That was a realm that was seen as, this is not true, but it was seen as being non, not necessarily intellectually required, seen as something that would be sort of of the nature of the people who were in the group. Uh, and they were often um, expected, enslaved people were expected to, uh, to perform at the whim of their, of their masters. And so the idea of performing um, has been one of the exceptions going back to enslavement in our history where African Americans have historically been uh, permitted to, to presumably achieve. What has happened, of course, over time is that they used that one exception to begin to, uh, to build, uh, build upon their talents and, and to have tremendous dominance in some aspects of our culture as a result of that. But on top of that, you know, the, the fact that people do manage to uh, succeed in spite of the many barriers that have been in existence for, for generations. It, it also is a sign that, that there has been so much lost potential and talent. If you have a few who are able to, permitted to get through, then that's a sign that actually a lot of people have not been, very likely been permitted to, to get through. Um, the people who do make it have to overcome tremendous barriers. We should also remind ourselves that the idea of people uh, making this adjustments to and rising in the caste system has often been because there have been um, these, the, the laws changed in the 1960s that opened a way for people to be able to take on positions that they might not have had in the civil rights legislation that, that uh, uh, outlawed, prohibited dem uh, discrimination against people on the basis of their uh, race, ethnicity, uh, national origin, and of course, gender. So that women and, and people of all backgrounds, discrimination against them was made illegal. And so it's been since that time, this is a fairly new idea, fairly new um, opportunities for people to actually rise to, to levels beyond what had been uh, assigned for so long. And yet, of course, we're still living with the remnants of a system that prescribed the kinds of occupations people were allowed to hold according to caste. Uh, you know, today we see Americans of color being affected by the coronavirus at vastly higher rates than their white neighbors. The quickest explanation of this is, well, these folks are in jobs that put them at risk. Some people seem to view that as like a reasonable explanation, as if it's not very strange that most of the high paying, socially distant jobs are given to the dominant caste and most of the people who have to be at risk on a daily basis are people of color. Yes, I think that, you know, we take these things for granted as the laws of nature because they've been in existence for so long, but they are what uh, that uh, they are the shadow of what has been the originating hierarchy of the country in which people who uh, were of African descent were enslaved for 246 years. And I need to say that 246 years means 12 generations of enslavement. That, that is, um, you know, that is, you try to imagine how many greats you have to add to the word grandparent to begin to conceive of how long that lasted. Then you add another uh, 100 years or so of Jim Crow caste system uh, that restricted people until the 1960s and 70s. So the idea of this has been such a long standing. Um, uh, configuration in our country that we are still living with the after effects to this day. And so, yes, during the, the uh, particularly became aware in the initial um, months of the of coronavirus that there were, you know, there were people who were um, consigned to certain kind of roles that we then, you know, that, that were perhaps maybe not even surprising to many people because this has been the way that it's been for so long. People on the front lines, people who were, um, you know, stacking shelves at a grocery store or driving, uh, driving buses, public buses and public transportation, delivering uh, goods to people who had the luxury of staying in place and who were more likely to be, uh, to be uh, of dominant caste. Um, these are the ways that we see caste play out right now in, in our current era. I want to go back to something you mentioned a few minutes ago, which is that we've lost the talents for generations of people in the subjugated caste who have been really um, kept out of occupations that they could have really excelled in. I was surprised to find in the book um, the research that you did about alpha dogs and alpha wolves and the way we sort of misunderstand the way that actually works in nature. 
talk to us about that and how that <laughs> relates to this. Thank you for asking. You're the first person to ask about that. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, no, the thing is that in the natural world, um, you know, we speak about alpha dog, alpha men or alpha women or whatever it might be um, as someone who is, you know, hard charging and and, you know, um, you know, makes demands and, you know, knows how to take charge and, and is in control at all times. People are fearful of this, this person. And and actually in the natural world, the alpha is a naturally occurring um, position that's based upon respect for that that um, individual. I'm speaking of lupine wolves or canines, dogs, and they are they rise to that level because it's naturally uh, because of the because the pack recognizes that uh, person as being in charge. And also, um, they tend to be uh, packs act, tend to be family systems. So there's one of cooperation to begin with. But essentially, the 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 actual alphas in the natural world do not um, make people do anything. They do not, they do not um, you know, attack and uh, control and bully. They do not do that. They actually, they actually uh, their job is to lead and also to lead by example and to, uh, and to often, they are accorded privileges. They eat first only because they're the ones that are leader that need to be protected, but they are the ones that, that hang back and, uh, and that are naturally uh, respected. They don't have to assert themselves for a respect. They have earned respect because of the way that they um, they carry and protect uh, the, the pack. Their job is to protect and to strengthen others, not to elevate themselves. And so one of the things that we realize is that because we have a different uh, perspective on what an alpha actually is supposed to be, it means that a lot of people, and also that alphas are, are attached to a particular identity, meaning men are more likely or expected to be alpha, uh, particular if you're a particular group in our country, uh, the dominant group, people who are born to the dominant group would be expected to be the ones in charge, in control, in power. But that does not mean that, you know, when you speak about, you know, 7 billion people on the planet, entire groups of people, there are going to be naturally occurring leaders in any group. There are going to be there are going to be women who would be more likely to be the you know the protective leaders of a particular group. There may be um, uh, people of African descent who would be the more natural protective leaders of a particular group. There may be people of of uh, in, indigenous people and, and Latino and and in other words, if we had a fair and open world, it would mean we would be looking for the qualities that are um, that are seen as supportive for the entire group in leadership, as opposed to assuming that just because of what you look like, you would be a natural, you would be the natural person to be leader. And so um, that's why I mentioned um, and had a moment of exploration in the book about what that word really means. We hear it a lot, don't we? Yeah, and it's the, as you say, the insecure alpha is the one that goes around biting all the other wolves or dogs. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's the insecurity combined with the expectation that one should be the alpha that becomes a more dangerous combination because uh, they may not have the natural, uh, the, they have not perhaps earned the natural, the trust and, and respect of those uh, in their pack. And yet they feel that and feel that they need to work ever harder to, um, you know, to uh, insist upon and in some ways bully or uh, force people to, to respect. And so that's why the insecurity combined with the expectation of being an alpha can be a really um, a difficult combination that, that ultimately um, serves, serves very few people. It, it really is not serving anyone in a situation like that. I'm Chris Boyd, and today we're talking to Isabel Wilkerson, author of Cast, The Origins of Our Discontent, now among the nominees on the National Book Awards long list for nonfiction. Chris Boyd. Today we're talking to Isabel Wilkerson, winner of the Pulitzer Prize and National Humanities Medal, about her book Cast, The Origins of Our Discontent. Let's return to that conversation. Why do so many members of the highest caste in the United States, white people of European descent, seem to walk around feeling their status is always at risk? That is a really great question. 
Um, my first response to that is because it's not real to begin with. And so if it's not real, then it's easier to feel threatened by any challenge to it. Again, race is a social construct. For most of human history, people did not d identify themselves and according to what we now call race. It's a fairly new construction dating back only four or 500 years. We have now uh, seen the results of the analysis of the, of the human genome, and that has found that human beings are all 99.9% .9 the same. Th these are the most superficial differences upon which entire wars have been waged upon which, you know, enslavement, you know, went on for 250 years practically, and then followed by a hundred years of, of additional restrictions and subjugation. So this is, this is not, it's not real. And, and if, if something is so, uh, is on such a shaky foundation, then I think people would feel even more threatened by any challenge to it. Is it too optimistic to hope that, you know, if that, sense of anxiety is tied to some awareness that none of this is real, that there is room for change? I mean, what would it take to cause people in the dominant caste to kind of reckon with the false beliefs they've been raised on? Well, I think the challenge is that we've lived with it for long enough that people have grown accustomed to the, the artificial ranking of everyone and grown accustomed to the entitlements that come through no fault or action of one's own, I've grown accustomed to the ways that the that the country has worked to such a degree. I mean, I'd say that I describe that, you know, cast is like the, describe our country as being like a house. And in a house, you know, you can't see the pillars and the joists and the beams, but you know that it's there because the house is standing. And so because we cannot see it, one of the powers of of cast is that it's invisible to us. You know, we don't have to see it, but we know that it's at work because the hierarchies, we've absorbed the messaging for so long that we've absorbed the meaning, these artificial meanings. So I think that the problem is that we've lived with it for so long that people don't see it and they assume these things to be the way things should be. Getting people to see ourselves differently is the goal of the book, actually. It's a goal. The goal has been to shine a light on our country, to see what we might not have otherwise seen. I call it holding up an x-ray of our country up to the light so that we can see what we have inherited. You know, it's like we have all inherited this old house that none of us alive had anything to do with building, but all of us have inherited. And now, you know, those uh, uneven pillars and joists are left for us to deal with. You know, when you inherit a house, you may not want to, you know, go into the basement. You may not really want to know all the things that are wrong with it. But if you don't know what's wrong with it, you have to deal with the consequences, whether you know or not. You know, ignorance is no protection against one's inaction. And you cannot fix what you cannot see. And so the goal of this is to allow us all to see truly what's underneath these enduring divisions. I mean, we've tried so many things in the past, and we've had multiple civil rights legislation. We had civil rights, rights, civil rights legislation in the 1860s and 70s. Then we had civil rights legislation in the 1960s and, and into the 70s. And so we have tried so many things, and yet this still persists, as anyone who watches the news can see. And so I am suggesting that there's another way to look at this as something underneath that we've not been seeing. Let's look at it, let's see it, and let's uh, apply language that has been in place for thousands of years in other hierarchies to better see our own in hopes that we can somehow come together and heal. I would say that one of the goals of this is to, in looking at this, to finally get on the same page about our country's history. So many things about our country we really have not known. I know this personally because when I wrote The Warmth of the Suns, it's been exactly 10 years ago this month, and the thing that I would hear time and time again from people is I had no idea. I hear it from people all the time. And that means that most of us have been in some ways deprived of the full story of our, of our own country's history, you know, how we got to where we are. And I think that our current era calls upon us you know, to go into that basement, into the places that we might not have known and seen and look, look, look at this more closely so that we can get on the same page about how we got to where we are. Um, what is it that we're seeing right now and how can we move forward together um, as a country, as a people, uh, as a species even, so that we can heal? Is there anything inherent to a large society that seems to require some kind of permanent underclass? You know, there is a 
question about how is it that you could have uh, an entire society where people truly view one another as fellows in this journey called life. And I think that, you know, I'm, I don't know and cannot say I've not studied every society in, in, you know, in human history, um, but I do know that in other societies where there is not this hardened line of, of hierarchy as, as is the case in, in our country, there is more of a willingness to see one's fellow citizen as someone who affects them, who feels that how other people are doing does affect them. They have more of a stake in the well-being of others. I mean, we know that there are other countries that actually have health care for all, and this is not a political statement. I'm just saying this is what they have. There are places where children are all getting fairly the same opportunities for education, you know, uh, for as they're, as they're uh, I'm thinking of such countries as Finland, for example, much of Scandinavia, Th those countries also rank extremely high in maybe the most important metric of all, which is happiness. Meaning a more egalitarian society makes for, you know, happier people. There are countries that, that have uh, a more egalitarian perspective and take more responsibility, meaning the citizens t feel more of a responsibility to each other. This is not about government. This is about our investment, our sense of connect connection to each other. Um, in the course of doing this book, I, I uh, reporting on, uh, researching for it, I uh, came across this video, which I then included in the book, and that was a video out of uh, out of the UK, in which someone went and and asked citizens on the street, "What do you think it costs in America to get this particular medical treatment? What do you think it costs?" And the responses were stunning to me. They were asked these questions. One woman was asked, you know, how much do you think it costs to get, you know, to have a baby, to deliver a baby in, in America? And she made some, you know, ridiculously low number from the American perspective. And when she was told the actual number, she said, to have a baby that much? <laughs> Someone was, a man was asked, you know, how much do you think it costs to have an ambulance to take you to the hospital? And he said, they charge for that? <laughs> I just thought, now, this is not a comment on quality of care. This is not a comment on, you know, which, you know, on, on the politics of this. This is a comment on uh, human expectations for how a society should take care of its own. And a sense that there are other places where people have a feeling of connectedness to others in the society and feel a sense of responsibility that if we, if I am taken care of and if they are taken care of and we're all taken care of, then we will do better. If everyone is doing better and I am doing better, then we all do better. And that's a whole different mindset. And I think that divisions, these artificial divisions of hierarchy make it harder to see the connections that we all have with one another. Of the three caste systems we've talked about today, one of them you know, was run by Adolf Hitler. Is there something about a caste system that makes a society vulnerable to fascist leadership? I certainly believe that because of the hardened lines uh, where people are feeling under, can often be feel under threat because of what we were saying, that a lot of this is it's not real anyway, can make people uh, cleave together with their one group, make people, make people more prone to tribalism and nas nationalism because they're protecting what they, what they have been told is their birthright. And those, the language of birthright and, and uh, tribal, um, tribal centrality or tribal superiority, all of these words are distancing, division, d dividing words. And, and I think that it, it can lead to uh, looking to individuals who represent, uh, represent the, the need or the desire to maintain power and maintain dominance. Um, ab absolutely, it creates a, a, a world in which people have themselves and then the other. And by othering, then that creates um, uh, a distance that, that leads to further and further division. So hopefully everyone in America will read your book and understand the ideas <laughs> you're talking about. But I wonder, to what extent do you th think the 2020 elections will be a kind of referendum on the American caste system, even among people who don't really think about our society in those terms? I don't think that, first of all, this, this caste system has been in, a, in place for 400 years. Um, it is, um, 
you know, it, it is very, very strong. And it is, uh, because it's not visible to people, um, that is what gives it longevity. Um, I am hopeful that once people recognize it for what it is and they see the damage that it does, because we often can't see the damage that it's doing, uh, that, and I think that people are becoming more aware in recent times of the damage that these divisions are, are, uh, have wrought on, on us, that then people can, uh, can uh, rise to the occasion and, um, and act. This, the goal here is that they would act, that they would feel radical empathy for others uh, who they've been told may be different from them, see the connections that we all have and rise above it. Uh, caste has been with us for so long, hierarchy, whatever you want to call it, has been with us for so long that it's not about one, uh, one person, one election, uh, one individual. This is something that uh, requires all of us, every one of us, to search ourselves first. That's what we have control over. And then act accordingly in our everyday lives um, and support uh, policies that would create more egalitarianism and be able to, and also to find joy, to find joy and pride in the the accomplishments and the uh, and the successes of anyone in our species. To stop thinking about ourselves as this group or that group, but to be to look at awe and amazement at what the species is is, is capable of. In other words, to think truly in a humanitarian way. And to think about uh, a humanitarian perspective, not just for ourselves and our own families and our country, but for the planet, for the planet itself. So I'm a middle-aged white lady and I'm still <laughs> learning not to take in ideas like the ones we've been talking about and think, yes, all those other people in the dominant caste are the problem. Um, I, because I have read this book, can't possibly be part of the problem. Do you have some thoughts about how we can all learn to kind of interrogate the role that we play, even unintentionally, um, in perpetuating these systems that we recognize are wrong? Well, I have so many metaphors in the book, and one of them involves the idea of when you go to the doctor and you are, you know, you first go there and you, you get a diagnosis that's a very difficult diagnosis, you, you don't start blaming, you start, and hopefully you don't start blaming, you start doing the research to try to understand it, what you're up against, so that you can have the best chance of combating it. For people, another uh, analogy that I use is one of what alcoholics do when they are, when they're overcoming alcoholism, you're viewing it as, uh, as, a, as another part, a human condition, a human condition, what we're faced with, we've inherited it, it's no one's fault, the idea of caste is structural, it's not about, you know, blame and shame, it's about the structure that we've inherited. And so when it's a structure that you inherited, like an old house, then it means that you have to just roll up your sleeves and get to work. And when you have an old house, you know that the work is never done. You know, the work, is, as soon as you fix one thing, there's something else to be fixed. You don't assume that the house will never need adjustments, never need repair. You know that the house will need repair. So if we are all, you know, the country's like a house, and if we individually are like houses, then that means that we are always having to work on ourselves. We're always, we can never declare the work done. It's never done. We can never say, I'm done, I've read this, and now I'm done, there's nothing else to do. There's always work to be done. And you know, when people, um, you know, there's a lot to learn from the 12 steps program, you know, for all people, whether they have, you know, have this in their family or not, the idea that it's never, it's never declared done. You are always working on it. You are always uh, vigilant to uh, to the things that could hurl you backward. It's it's part of the human condition to know that when you, in our case, have been programmed, and all of us have been programmed into uh, into recognizing who is viewed as dominant in the society, who is viewed as subjugated in the society, and have had to navigate these assumptions and stereotypes, every single one of us has to navigate the assumptions and stereotypes. We have all been programmed. And when you recognize that we all have been programmed, then that means that we all have to do the work our, of, on ourselves to deprogram ourselves from the stereotypes and assumptions that we've all inherited. Again, it's not about, about being a good person or a bad person. It's not about uh, blame or, sh or shame or guilt. It's about rolling up our sleeves and doing what is necessary for ourselves, for our family, for the good of our families, for the good of our communities, the good of our country and the species.
That was my conversation from late last week with Isabel Wilkerson talking about her newest book, Cast, The Origins of Our Discontent. You can like our page on Facebook. We're also on Twitter at KERA Think. And subscribe to our podcast free wherever you get your podcast. Just search for KERA Think. You can also get that podcast at our website where you can find descriptions of upcoming shows. That is think.kera.org. Again, I'm Chris Boyd. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Thank you.